What are the key indicators you look for within companies before making an investment? Well, I look for something that does give them a motor, Rob. We have a company called Seas Candy out on the West Coast. Seas Candy is box chocolates. If you give a box of Seas chocolates to your girlfriend on the first day and she kisses you, we own you. You know, I mean, we, we can raise the price tomorrow. I mean, you'll buy the same box. You're not going to fool her out with success. So if you've got an economic castle, People are going to come and want to take that castle away from you. And you better have a strong moat. You better have a knight in the castle that knows what he's doing. You're not buying an asset. You're buying a name. You're buying a brand. You're buying a real franchise here. Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. This video is part two of a four part series where I take you step by step through the framework that Warren Buffett and Phil Town use to beat the market and show you how we can use their knowledge and wisdom to beat the market ourselves. If you missed the first part of the series, which was an introduction to the framework used by Buffett and Town, I'll put a link somewhere up here at the top so you guys can watch that before watching this one. So today we're gonna to pick up where we left off on the four M's and we're gonna move on to the second M, which is moat. So a moat refers to what Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger call a durable competitive advantage. According to Munger, a competitive advantage is a characteristic of a business that gives it a competitive edge over its competitors. And durable simply means how long that edge will last into the future. It's referred to as a moat simply because it serves the same purpose. A durable competitive advantage protects a business's operations and profits, just like a strong moat protects a castle from attackers. So why is a moat important? In the last video in the series, we talked about how in order to follow rule one, which is to not lose money, we need to invest with certainty. And if we want to invest with certainty, we need to be able to safely assume that a business will continue to operate successfully for 10 or 20 years and not get overrun by competition. If a company doesn't have a durable competitive advantage, then it's much harder to predict the future of that company, which makes it a no-go. As Phil Town says, obviously you want a business that will be a winner, a business that will continue to grow for decades into the future. But if you can't predict with a high degree of certainty that it will be a winner, then its future isn't predictable. And as a rule one investor, you never buy a company with an uncertain future. Now, there's many different types of moats that a business can have. And according to Phil Town, there's five different types and we're gonna look at each one in detail. And then later on in the video, I'm gonna show you the big five numbers that show if a business does have a strong durable moat. So the five types of moats are brand, secret, toll bridge, switching, and price. A brand moat is when a company's brand is so strong that customers will continue to use their products even if competitors pop up with similar offerings. Nearly all of the biggest businesses in the world have massive brand moats that protect their business from competitors. Google has a massive brand moat, so does Coca-Cola and so does Twitter. Phil Town uses a great example from his book about Harley Davidson. He says it's the look, the sound, the feel and the personality of the motorcycle that Harley owners buy. That Harleys have been around for decades and they will continue to be around for decades more. He says that in the 70s they had to compete with Japanese companies like Honda. Honda makes a better motorcycle from a technical point of view and it's much less expensive. But it's still not a Harley and they had a tough time convincing motorcycle riders around the world to change from the brand that they loved and respected. The next moat on the list is secret. Phil Town says moats can be created by trade secrets that keep other businesses from copying a product or formula. Most pharmaceutical companies have a big secret moat as all of their drugs are patented. Coca-Cola have a secret moat because their recipe is trade secret and it can't be copied. And because of that, no other cola tastes quite like Coke. Tech companies can also have secret moats because of intellectual property and patented technologies, like Tesla has with its battery cells and its full self-driving technology. These moats can be especially strong as they're protected by law. Okay, moving on. The next moat is what's known as a toll bridge moat. So a toll bridge moat is like a company owning the only bridge to get into a popular island. You don't have to cross the bridge, but if you want to go to wherever that bridge leads, then you have to pay the toll. And whoever owns that bridge only has to worry about someone else coming and building another bridge beside their bridge. Now, in reality, it's hard to find a company with a toll bridge moat that isn't state-owned or isn't a private company. But there are some examples. Toll bridge moats can also apply to other sectors of businesses. Like, for example, digital advertising. Let's say you wanted to put up an online ad for your new business. If you wanted to target the maximum amount of people for your ad, then you'd probably put your ad on either Facebook or Google. And to do that, you'd need to pay sort of a toll to them to use their service. So Google and Facebook both have durable toll bridge modes. The fourth mode we're gonna be looking at is something known as a switching mode. A switching mode is when switching from one company to another is so much pain and bother that it's not even worth considering. 
Phil Town uses the example of Microsoft and their massive switching mode. He says, even if people don't like Microsoft, it's so much pain and bother to switch from their operating system and to use another company. He says, Linux could give away their system for free and still not make much of a dent in Microsoft's market share. Another example is switching from Android to iOS and vice versa. Some people don't mind switching, but most people won't even consider switching from what they know and use. Wix and Shopify also have a switching mode because if you build an online retail store or website on their platform, then it's really hard to switch because you'll have to build your entire store from scratch. So Apple, Google, Wix, Shopify, and Microsoft are all examples of big switching modes. The last type of mode that a business can have is a price mode. Simply put, a price mode is when a business can price its products or services so low that other companies cannot compete on price. Nowadays, a lot of people are inclined to pay more for a premium high quality products, like when it comes to food and consumables. But in a lot of categories, people will always buy the cheapest possible products. Kmart, Costco and Bunnings are the best examples of companies with massive price modes. Price modes can be especially hard to cross because a company can destroy its profits by trying to compete on price with these giants. And the giants can do this because they're so strong financially that they don't need high profit margins to keep the business running. It would be virtually impossible for a small startup company to compete with Kmart and Bunnings on price and grow at the same time. So that's the five types of modes that a company can have. And as you can see, some companies can have two or three modes. For example, Google has a brand mode, a toll bridge mode, and a switching mode. But according to Phil Town, it's much more important to focus on the quality of the mode and not how many types of modes a business can have. The quality and durability is so much more important than the quantity. Remember, a moat is only used to determine how predictable it is that a business will continue to be around in 10 or 20 years. So one strong, sustainable, durable moat is much more beneficial to you than having a bunch of weak moats that can easily be crossed. Trying to figure out if a company has a durable competitive advantage can be difficult as it's kind of based on opinion and perception. Someone might say that this business has a moat and this guy might disagree completely. So to rule out this hearsay and confusion, Phil Town says that there are five big numbers that you need to get familiar with because these big five numbers will show if the business does have a strong durable moat. Once you get accustomed to these big five numbers, you'll find yourself skipping trying to figure out what type of moat a business has and you'll just go straight to the numbers. Phil Town says that if a business has a moat or not, it will show up in these big five numbers. And as I'm gonna show you guys pretty soon with some examples, mapping out these big five numbers gives you a really clear indication of how strong a company's moat is. And we can assume a reasonable degree of certainty how the business will perform into the future. So these are the big five numbers and they're ranked in order of importance. Number one, ROIC or return on invested capital. Number two, equity growth rate. Number three, EPS or earnings per share growth rate. Number four, revenue or sales growth rate. And number five, free cash flow growth rate. And with all of these numbers, you want to see at least 10% per year to know if the business has a moat or not. Now, if all of this sounds really scary, I promise you guys, it's so easy to find these numbers for any business and to calculate growth rates. I'm gonna quickly explain what each of the big five numbers mean. And then I'm gonna show you some examples of how to map out the big five numbers using some popular companies. So first up is ROIC or return on invested capital. Essentially ROIC is the return that a company makes on the capital invested into itself. And according to Phil Town, ROIC is the most important number to a rule one investor. He says that if the ROIC is below 10% a year, we don't even bother looking any further into the business. If a business has a low ROIC, then the management aren't correctly allocating capital being invested into the business to generate more profits. A solid ROIC of 10% or more shows that the management is on our side as owners, and they effectively use capital to generate more profits. The next big five number is equity growth. Equity growth is a measure of balance sheet strain and it's one of Warren Buffett's favorite numbers for calculating intrinsic value, which is something we'll get to in a later video when we get to the fourth M. So equity is the total assets of a business minus its total liabilities. Everything the business owns minus everything that it owes. And all of that equity is money for the owners, which is us. So equity growth is really important and we want to see at least 10% a year. Next, we have the EPS growth rate. EPS stands for earnings per share. And I'll show you guys soon how to find the EPS for a company so you don't have to calculate it yourself. But if you want to know the calculation, essentially it's the earnings or the net income divided by the amount of shares or shares outstanding. 
EPS growth is really important because it accounts for instances where, let's say a company had a really great year and it increased profits by 10%, but they created a bunch of new shares and they increased the numbers of shares in existence or the shares outstanding by 20%, something that's known as dilution. Then in reality, even though the company increased profits by 10%, the EPS would actually be lower. Because if you split the earnings between all of the shares, including the new shares, then you would have less earnings per share. And on the flip side, a company can use its profits to buy back its own shares, which reduces the numbers of shares outstanding, which increases the EPS. So a high EPS growth rate is really important, and we also want to see at least 10% a year. Okay, moving on, the fourth big five number is revenue growth. Revenue is simply all of the money that a company makes by selling its products or services. Revenue is the top line of every single income statement. Revenue growth is a strong sign that the company is selling more and more products and services. Profits can be increased even if revenue stays stagnant by cutting out operating expenses. But revenue growth shows that a company is generating more and more sales every year. And again, you want to see at least 10% a year. Okay, last but not least, we have free cash flow growth. Even though this is the last number of the big five, it's still a really important number to show the company's overall ability to generate cash flow. Looking at a business's ability to generate cash flow in the past gives us the ability to estimate with a reasonable degree of certainty how it will continue to do so in the future. Free cash flow is all of the cash that a company generated from its operations and after it's paid off all of its capital expenses like machinery and equipment. Free cash flow is money in the pocket of the owners and it's a really important number for calculating intrinsic value later in the series. So like the others, we want to see free cash flow grow by at least 10% a year. Now, even though 10% is the minimum for all of our big five numbers, the higher that the numbers are, the stronger and more durable the moat is. The more durable the moat is, the more that we can say with a reasonable amount of certainty that this business will continue to be around in 10 years, which is a huge part of being a wonderful business. Another awesome thing about Philtown is he created calculators on his website that we can use to calculate growth rates. So we don't have to do any calculations ourselves. So to get the big five, we basically just punch some numbers into a calculator and then we write out the results on a spreadsheet or a notepad. So to show you guys how easy it really is, I'm gonna jump on the computer and show you some examples. Okay, so we're here on my PC and I'm gonna show you some examples of how to map out the big five numbers for a couple of businesses. It's really simple and it only takes a few minutes. Now to do this, I need three tabs open. The first tab, which you can see now is my Google spreadsheet, which you can copy if you want, or you can write it out in a workbook. I used to write it all out myself, but honestly, it's so much easier to keep track of it this way. And Google Docs is completely free. So on the left, we have our big five numbers. And then across the top, we have our one year, our five year and our 10 year growth rates. And the reason we want all three is because Phil Town says we want to see the growth rates for the short term, the medium term and the long term being consistent and steady. If we have big five numbers that are all over the place, then that company's future is less predictable than a business with steady and solid big five numbers. So if a company's big five numbers are all over the place, then we just avoid them according to Phil Town. The second tab we need is our growth rate calculators. These amazing tools are generously provided by Phil Town on his website and they're completely free. To access it, just go to Google and type in rule one calculator. And it should be the first one that pops up under the website ruleoneinvesting.com. Just scroll down the page and you'll find 11 different calculators that you can use to do all of your important calculations like calculating the big five. So we have the ROIC calculator, the EPS growth rate calculator, the equity growth rate calculator, sales or revenue growth rate. And for free cash flow, we can just use the sales growth rate or the equity growth rate because they're basically the same thing. And for our third tab, we have quick FS. This is an amazing website for compiling company data and financials. And again, it's completely free. They have 10 years worth of data from most businesses and they provide key figures that other sites don't like ROIC and per year growth rates. So I'll put a link to this website in the description box for you guys. Okay, so for our first example, we're gonna be looking at a company called Nvidia, a mega cap tech and AI company in the US. And you might remember from the first video, it's one of the companies that kept coming up on my list over and over again as something that was inside my circle of competence. Now, before we begin, just remember, the big five just tells us if a business is wonderful and has a strong durable moat. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a good investment unless it's at an attractive price. So this is not a buy or sell recommendation for any business. These are all just examples to show you guys how to calculate the big five. Okay, so if we go back to our first tab, the first number that we're going to get is the ROIC. 
Now, I know there's an ROIC calculator on the other tab, but this one's pretty easy, and with the help of QuickFS, I can do this one on my own without the calculator. So if we go back to QuickFS, we can see that the 10 year ROIC is already given to us. So we go back to our spreadsheet and we write 19%. I like to round it up or down to whole numbers just to make it easier. For the five year, if we go back to QuickFS, we can see the return on invested capital or ROIC is listed down below. So we can just look at the last five numbers and roughly guess the average. So we have three 20s, a 30 and a 40. So I'll guess the average five year ROIC to be around 25. And finally, we just need last year's ROIC, which thanks to QuickFS we can see is 22. Okay, so that's the ROIC for the short term, the medium term and the long term and already it looks really good. Remember we wanted at least 10% for each period. And with Nvidia they're all at around 20% or above, which shows that the management are very efficient at allocating capital and they're getting solid returns investing in themselves. Okay, so the next number we're gonna do is the revenue growth rate. And to do that, we will need a calculator. So go to the second tab and open up the sales growth calculator. Now, this calculator is really simple to use. First, we need the latest revenue figure from QuickFS. So if we go back to QuickFS, we can see the revenue is the top line and the latest revenue figure is 16.7 billion. So we go back to our calculator and in the current sales, we write in that number. So 16,675. Now we go back to QuickFS and find the initial revenue. Since we're doing the 10 year first, we're gonna go back as far as we can. So for 2012, we can see the revenue is 3,998 or basically 4 billion. So I'll go back to the calculator and under initial sales, write 3,998. And finally, for the age of sales, you need the amount of years between the figures. It's really important not to count the initial sales year as one, otherwise it will mess up the calculation. So if our first year is 2012, we start counting at 2013. So from 2012, it's nine years until 2021. So we go back to our calculator and we change the age to nine. Now the calculator has done its thing and it's given us an average growth rate over nine years, which is 17%. So now we go back to the spreadsheet and we write 17 in the 10 year revenue. Now, if we want to do the five year, we leave the current sales as is and we just change the initial sales and the age. And the easiest way to find that is just to go to QuickFS and just start counting back from the current year. So five years back from 2021 is 2016. And remember, if we're counting years, don't count the first year as one. I know this might throw a couple of people off at first, but once you do it a few times, you won't need to think about it. So for 2016, our revenue figure is 5010. So we go back to the calculator and we write that in in our initial revenue. And then we just change our age to five and that gives us 27%. So we go back to the spreadsheet and we write in 27. And finally for the one year, we just need the figure for the year before our current year. So if we go to quick FS, we can see that that is 10,918. So I'll go to our calculator and in initial sales, type in 10,918 and then change the age to one. And that gives us a one year growth rate of 53%. Okay, so that's our revenue growth rates done. Now we'll dissect all these numbers later, but for now we're just gonna keep going and keep filling out the rest. So next up is EPS. So I'll go to the calculator and hit the back button. And then that's gonna bring us back to the list. And this time we're gonna choose the EPS growth rate calculator. Now it doesn't really matter which calculator you use because they all pretty much do the same thing, but I'm just gonna do it properly for you guys. So the first figure we need is our current EPS. So if we go to quick FS, we can see EPS or earnings per share is listed in here in the middle. And our latest figure is 1.73 or $1.73. So I'll go back to the calculator and in current EPS type in 1.73. So for our initial EPS, we already know the earliest year possible is nine years back. And that figure is 0 0.24. So I'll go back to the calculator and in initial EPS type 0 0.24. Then change the age to nine and that gives us an EPS growth rate of 25%. So I'll go back to the spreadsheet and under 10 year, just write 25%. And we're just gonna rinse and repeat what we did before for our five year. So we get our 2016 number, which is 0 0.27. So I'll change the initial EPS to 0 0.27 and change the age to five. And that gives us a five year growth rate of 45%. And for our one year, we just need 2020's EPS which is 1.13. Let's 
Let's go to initial EPS, 1.13, and change the age to one. And again, that also gives us a growth rate of 53%. Okay, so next up is equity. So I'll go back to our calculator, press the back button, and this time we're gonna use the equity growth rate calculator. Okay, so first things first, we need our current equity number. So I'll go back to QuickFS, and to find equity, we need to go to the balance sheet. So I'll go over to where it says overview, and there's a drop-down menu, and click on balance sheet. If we scroll down to the bottom, we can see second from the bottom, there's shareholders equity. Be careful not to pick liabilities and equity because that's the total liabilities plus the total equity. Okay, so you know the drill, we need our current equity number which is 16893. So I'll go back to our calculator and type in 16893. And now we need our initial equity. So this one's gonna be a little bit different because for some reason on the balance sheet, they have an extra year listed. So this time we're gonna be going from 2011, not 2012. So this time it'll be 10 years, not nine years. And for 2011, our equity number is 3181. Let's go to initial equity and type in 3181. Then we change our age to 10 and we get 18%. So I'll go back to our spreadsheet and type in 18%. For our five year, we just rinse and repeat. So we need our 2016 number which is 5762. So go to initial equity, type in 5762. Change the age to five, and we get 24%. Let's go to equity, type in 24%. And last but not least, for our one year, we just need the 2020 number, which is 12204. So we go back to the calculator and type in 12204, and change the age to one. And that gives us a one year growth rate of 38%. So we go back to the spreadsheet and type in 38%. And last but not least is free cash flow. Now, because free cash flow is a similar figure to equity and revenue, because they're all listed in millions or billions, we can use the equity or revenue growth rate calculator to calculate free cash flow growth. So we're just gonna stick with the equity one. So to find free cash flow, we go to quick FS, go back to the drop down menu, and this time select key ratios. So scroll down until you find supplementary items and you'll see free cash flow listed there. And this time we're starting from 2012 again, so watch out for that 10 year growth rate and make sure to put nine years. So first things first, we need our 2021 number, which is 4694. So for the current number, put 4694. And for our initial number, we put 770. So go back to initial and put 770. And then we change the age to nine. And that gives us a growth rate of 22%. For our five year, we need our 2016 number, which is 1096 and change the age to five and that gives us 34 percent and last but not least we just need our one year number which is 4272 so put 4272 and change the age to one and that gives us a growth rate of 10 percent okay so now we have our completed table of all of the big five numbers for the short term the medium term and the long term and there seems to be a trend where the numbers are increasing more and more in the short term which is good because it shows the business isn't slowing down in fact it's doing the opposite it's speeding up and the numbers themselves are really strong most of them are well above the 10 percent minimum and they have some crazy growth rate numbers for equity and eps which is really important and the 10-year numbers are insanely good so by these numbers, you can clearly see that Nvidia has a really strong durable moat. And you can predict with a reasonable amount of certainty that based on these five numbers, Nvidia will continue to be around 10 plus years from now. Because I understand Nvidia, I can say off the top of my head that I think Nvidia has a really strong brand moat and a bunch of copyrighted technologies, which gives them a secret moat. But these big five numbers really show that it has a moat. So it's not just my opinion whether they do or not. Like it's pretty clear by looking at these numbers. Another example of a company with a really strong durable moat by the numbers is Alibaba. Their 10 year numbers are some of the best I've ever seen and I've already completed the big five table for you guys for Alibaba. So if we take a look, their 10 year numbers are absolutely incredible. So for revenue, it's 48% per year. EPS is 45% per year. Equity, 64% per year. Free cash flow, 45% per year. And ROIC is 15% per year. So their growth rates are absolutely enormous and I can pretty much say with complete certainty that Alibaba has a massive durable moat. They did have an EPS drop off in the one year, but if you look into why, it's because they paid a fine last year that hurt profits just one time and it's not really that big of a deal to them financially. Again, this is why understanding the business is really important and a must before you even look at the big five. Okay, so the last thing I wanna show you is an example of a really bad big five. 
I just plug some random numbers in to show you what a company with a really bumpy pass looks like. So if we look at these numbers, I mean they're all over the place. There's no way we can look at a business like this and assume it will do well in the future if it has a pass like this. And therefore it doesn't meet our predictability requirement according to Fieldhound. If we want to beat the market and get at least 15% return per year, we need to choose businesses that we can be certain about the future of that business and buy it at the right price. If its future isn't predictable, we don't even look at it. Okay, so one last point on the big five before the end of the video. Fieldtown says just because a company had a really good big five in the past doesn't mean that they'll continue to have a good big five in the future. Past growth rates alone are not enough to predict the future, which is why we don't rely on growth rates alone to make predictions. We also have to use the first M. If we don't understand the business and if the business doesn't have meaning to us, then we can't predict with any degree of certainty what that business will do, even if it has a really good moat. And we also need to use the other two M's, which is management and margin of safety, which are the next two videos in this series. So that's it for this video, guys. You've made it through the second M and we're halfway through the series. I know this was a load of information and it was a lot to get through. Out of the four M's, Moat is probably the longest part of the series just because it took a lot of time to get all of those numbers. And hopefully you guys can start digging into companies that have meaning to you and that you understand and you can start finding out if they have moats. If something I said didn't make sense or if you have any questions at all, please let me know in the comments down below. I'll reply to every single question. In my next video, we'll be looking at the third M, which is management. And in particular, we'll be looking at the CEO to see if he's on our side as shareholders and how to see if they have ownership in the business or if they have skin in the game. If you've watched the video all the way to the end, thank you so much for watching. If you guys enjoyed the video or if you learned something new, I'd really appreciate it if you whack that like button as it really supports the channel. And if you want to see more videos like this one or get notified when the rest of the series comes out, hit that subscribe button and tap the little bell there. And as always, this video is not financial advice. It's just my opinion for entertainment purposes only. Please always do your own research when making any investment decisions. So that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.